So I actually think um, patenting is uh, very important because, like, um, when selling this project to a company, we would be um, we we want to give them like like you said uh, we want to give them like uh, the benefits of our project our construct and therefore by um, studying regulations and um, uh, patenting it we could uh, we people would just uh, put more effort into characterizing it and uh, therefore we could uh, I guess it'd, it'd be much easier for us to sell our projects to um, industries and um, I guess. Uh, get more sponsorship in the future? Well, uh, I guess it's really a balance you have to look at. I mean, on one hand, you know, patenting is one form that, one suggested way in which we can ensure, you know, regulation and good characterization of parts. But on the other hand, pat, um, open source is something that lets things like, well, the iGem we're participating ha in happen. I mean, while it's great to, you know, get funds for a project, it's also, you know, open source is what allows it to be affordable in the first place. So there's a balance with that, just as much as there's the balance that Jeremy mentioned, where we have to, you know, think about while you want to, you know, sell your project, you also need to consider the ethical implications of your project, whether they be positive or negative even though you might fear that, you know, the negative aspect might turn people away. It's something that has to be discussed. And that's partly the reason why we've held this conference, because despite, you know, the concerns that people need to know about education, like they need to be educated about synthetic biology, what it is, what it can actually do. We also have to understand that, you know, regardless of a person's, I guess, extent of knowledge on the issue, they m very likely have, you know, valid concerns that must be considered. You can't just, you know, sell your project and not expect to get some sort of feedback that might not necessarily be something you like. So uh, conferences such as this allow for, you know, open discourse. People can share their concerns. I mean, we've, we've had a little bit of, um, of talk about the proactionary precautionary viewpoints and this is a sort of I guess um, this is a sort of type of media which would allow the people who are on either side of such topics to discuss with each other because that's how you have you know meaningful discourse and how you kind of figure well you learn what the benefits and cons of whatever you're doing and you sort of figure out a compromise. So with that being said, I will invite any, I guess, last thoughts on both just synthetic biology, its future, and the New Yorker article. Well, Mandy, I just wanted to come back to when we're talking about the proactionary and precautionary frameworks here. I just, coming back to the New Yorker article, I'd like to read just a quick, um, paragraph or quote from Durendi and see what you guys, your guys' opinion on this. So it says, but some environmental groups will say, let's not permit any of this work to get out of a laboratory until we ensure it is all safe. And as a practical matter, that is not the science. And as a practical matter, that is not the way science works. We can't come back decades later with an answer. We need to develop solutions by doing them. The potential is great enough, I believe, to convince people it's worth the risk. So I guess my personal opinion is, well, I'm proactionary in the sense that I think that in order to gain an understanding, as Drew was talking about, about synthetic biology, we first have to delve in there and we need to, under, we need to start putting genes together and we need to understand how things work to gain a greater understanding of what the potential benefits or um, what the potential benefits of synthetic biology are. So I'm just wondering what your guys' opinion is on this. I think that's a really valid point in that with something like this, we don't know what we can do yet. And so it seems kind of kind of fruitless to sit or, like to not do anything while we try to figure out what the possible regulations and what things are going to look like when we don't ourselves know what we can do. And I think the only way that we can get a better idea of what we're going to do is if we actually start doing some of these things. 
And as you said, the we have to look at the possible benefits of this, and that the benefits are huge. And is this something we're willing to not even consider because of the possible risks? I guess it just, it, it again is a balance, as Mandy talked about. And I thought what was interesting in the article was the compare, was the, the part that they brought up about if these genes could possibly, you know, fight cancer, if we could create a system that would fight cancer, would people be saying different things then than now? And what we have right now is something that can produce malaria drugs and there's you know people in Africa dying of malaria would would people in North America particularly see this differently if it was something that directly benefited us now or would they still be as hesitant to go forward with it yeah definitely there's I guess the poly perceptions where we think about you know um, is it worth the risk and I guess will you find that it depends a lot on what society feels about what you're doing is worth the risk. I mean, without, you know, being socially relevant, you can't have, you know, funding to run your projects. It's it's a lot based on not just the decision of the scientist to be, well, why don't we try this? You also have to understand that there are a lot of, I guess, drawbacks. Well, not drawbacks, I guess, you know, points of control from society outwards that said, no, you can't because we feel this. So in that case, I guess in a way you could say that synthetic biology can be regulated through society, almost. I agree with that, Mandy, and with that, um, personally I feel that we should take a proactionary approach to um, synthetic biology because um, like like uh, Jeremy and uh, Emily had mentioned earlier that we don't know um, the, like what it could do. So without understanding um, its ap like its applications, we can't decide on um, whether we want to um, we want to take it further or not. So uh, I believe that as problems if problems do um, come up, we can it can be dealt with at um, as they arise, and therefore we should take um, a proactionary approach and uh, go go um, forward with it and deal with the problems as they come up. Thank you very much, everyone. So if anyone would like to read the article we've been discussing and look further into some issues with synthetic biology, um, feel free to check out The New Yorker. The article, once again, its name is A Life of Its Own by Michael Spector and was published on September 28th. So this concludes our brief Second Life conference. Um, I'd like to say that it was very interesting. Um, we found that, you know, you can kind of mirror what an actual sort of talk would look like sitting around together without actually being having to be in the same place. I guess that's the convenience of it. And we've had some really interesting viewpoints that are shared. And although it was just our team, we've got quite a diversity of thoughts. And I think that um, this can be further brought out with um, having, you know, other individuals in Second Life from, you know, wherever because of the accessibility. So I feel that uh, this talk was very successful and I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mandy, for hosting this. And we'd also like to thank Stefan, who is also our video cameraman. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. And maybe even learned some new things about where synthetic biology is headed and what we need to take into consideration when going forward with it. All right, well, this was a great test run for Second Life conferencing, and we hope that we will be able to use it in the future as well. Thanks for watching.